send me positive prayers that it all goes the way I'm hoping it will go. So Kyle mentioned when he welcomed us all here that nobody's perfect. Why aren't we? What do we do that makes us not perfect? We sin. So I have some, I'm, I'm doing a little ex science experiment with you guys today. So I have these cups labeled me, labeled Jesus, and labeled sin. I'm nervous. Do you see my hand shaking? And I do this every day for a living. <laughs> <laughs> so in the meat cup, I'm going to pour some water. ourselves again. See? Ask Jesus into our heart and ask Jesus into and for forgiveness of those sins. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Plus that song, the, the last song. Now she hold it up for me right there and show everybody what happens. See what's happening? Jesus is cleansing that sin from our bodies. How awesome is that? Right? I'm so sorry that I was so nervous for this lesson. I, I thought I was good to go. <laughs> all right, so we have to pray and ask Jesus, Jesus for forgiveness because we all let sin into our lives. Okay? So that was today's message. Jesus will cleanse us of our sins. All we have to do is pray and ask. Okay? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these children and for the family members that brought them. And we ask your guidance over their lives. This last week was our first week of school, so... Um, I just pray that all these children have a great year in whatever school they go to. I pray just your blessings over these children and the families that brought them here. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
you for another day that you have given us. We thank you for the rain that you provided for us uh, yesterday and last night. We thank you for the sunshine that you give. We thank you for our jobs, our finances, our homes, our friends, our family. We especially thank you for this church that we can come and worship you. We thank you for the freedoms that our country has that we can worship you without persecution. Lord, we thank you for that. And we ask you if you continue to bless this country, watch over it, bless the leaders of this country that they make the decisions that are pleasing to you. Be with those soldiers um, that are listed in our bulletin and the ones that are uh, all around the world, dear Lord. Watch over them and bring them back safely to their to their families one day, dear Lord. We uh, thank you for um, the policemen that we have um, in this country and for the firefighters and the emergency workers. We thank you for them and the ones that even volunteered at the time. We ask you to watch over them and bless them. Dear Lord, you heard the many people that were mentioned today for prayer. We lift these people up to you. Uh, we have the faith that you can make them well, and we ask you if you will do your will and heal them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. And we ask you if you will help us to accept the answer that is given on these requests. We don't always understand why, but watch over them. Comfort those who mourn. Forgive those who sin. Heal those that are sick. Watch over those that are um, in nursing homes and, and, and hospitals. Uh, restore hope to those that are living in war for lands. Shield those that need trial and mercy. And comfort the dying. We thank you for your son Jesus that we know through him that we can have eternal life. We thank you for that gift that's already been bought and paid for. We only accept and we only believe. And we thank you for that free gift. We thank you for um, the prayer that your, your son taught us to pray when his disciples asked him and he said pray like this our father, our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy, thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Okay, we live in, in troubled times. Jesus told us a couple thousand years ago that when he returns for us, the world will be full of violence. So uh, I think we've arrived. <laughs> uh, he's with us and he'll take care of us. I like in the Bible where it says the Lord thunders before his army. That's real good. He's out there, the bad guys are over there, and we're back behind Jesus. I, I like that real good. Okay? And he'll take us to Jerusalem and he's going to reign there. And righteousness is going to come forth from Jerusalem. And the result of that righteousness is going to be peace and quietness. So how good that will be. We'll take a thousand years of that, okay? And then we'll see what he has in store for us. Uh, something's happening. Uh, we Gideons uh, are a big organization. In 200 countries of the world, we have Gideon groups like I belong to in Somerset. And those folks set up distribution in their country. And then they request Bibles, and we ship them the Bibles. And then Gideons travel there at their own expense to help them. And God's just been blessing that for over a hundred years now. And we don't get thrown in jail very often. <laughs> uh, I'm sure I shouldn't say this. <laughs> My son's kind of a Baptist, you know, I kid him about the Baptists getting in trouble. Uh, we don't uh, get thrown in jail or get in trouble too often. But in country, those people set up distribution at their military, those hospitals, schools, you name it. And uh, that's how you get 200,000 Bibles into a capital city of Laos or Cambodia on a weekend, okay, because of the work that was done. But what's that up, add up to? The first hundred years, a billion Bibles out in the world. Now get this, 
Our numbers are declining. I didn't need to tell you that. We're getting older. We're losing people. But our distribution is going through the roof, and I think there's a reason for it. From 2002 to 2015, a second billion Bibles went out into the world. Now think about that. That's a lot of setting up distribution. That's a lot of open doors to receive God's Word. 2015 till now, through COVID, half a billion more went out. All right? There's a fellow named Antichrist. I don't know when he's coming. I think it's soon. But when he comes, he's going to be able to a button, and there'll be no more Charles Stanley on the radio. I heard from a preacher and a Bible study guy, he had 4,000 pieces of sermon and message out on the internet, all good stuff. And uh, without notice, in a moment, it was gone. So someday the Antichrist is not going to tolerate all that stuff out there on the airwaves. But this book here, and those billions of Bibles that are getting out into the world, he's not going to get his fingers on this printed word so quickly. Jesus Christ is going to come, take his church to heaven with him, and fulfill what he prayed for in Gethsemane, when he said, Father, those that you've given me out of the world, I want them to be with me and behold my glory. That's where we're going. The very best place because we are with Jesus. We are there with the 24 elders. We are beholding his glory. He returns to this earth, saves a remnant of the Jew, gives them a new heart, and rules and reigns from Jerusalem for a thousand years. In the tribulation, when the beast has his day, He'll be after this word to eliminate it. There will be a great multitude saved in the tribulation after we are with Jesus, I believe. Uh, that church will be being overcome, but overcoming. And at the end of the tribulation, there's a great multitude there saying to Jesus, avenge us, wait a little season, and I will go back and avenge. Uh, and they'll rule with Jesus on earth here We'll see what we're doing, but we'll have a good place. But uh, this word, he's not going to get his hands on so quickly. Now, how that will work, there's a fellow named Viktor Konchenko I met. He was a Russian. Uh, I met him about 20 or you know, 30 years ago. But Viktor was responsible for opening up the Soviet Union. So there was Gideon camps all across Europe and the Soviet Union. But in 1969, Viktor is about to graduate college. And this speaks to faithful people. I'm not here to pat you on the back, but I see your faces every time I come. There are faithful people working and staying in the way, waiting for Jesus to return. Victor was in one of those underground churches in 1969 in the Soviet Union. They had a basement church, about 80 people, a few copies of the Word of God. Victor is about to graduate college. He's going to be an engineer in the Soviet Union. Victor goes to campus, goes to college. Two men from the KGB meet Victor, and they say, Victor, come with us. And they take Victor to the dean's office. And there in the dean's office with the dean, the KGB fellows say, Victor, we got a good job for you out in the Soviet Union. You're going to graduate in a couple weeks here, and we can put you out on some good projects, and you'll be okay, Victor. But here's the deal. We want you to break fellowship with that church that you're going to over there in the basement. We want you to stop telling people about Jesus and having these Bible studies. And everything's going to be okay. Victor says, I'll not break fellowship with my church. And I'll not stop talking to people about Jesus. They say, okay, Victor. They look at the dean, dismiss his credits, erase his credits. They take Victor by the arm, march him off campus. In 1969, he starts out his career washing buses. But 20 years go by, Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall. Okay, openness comes to that land for a short time. <coughs> Who's still there? Victor. Who traveled all over Europe and Russia, opening up Gideon groups and setting up Bible distributions. Who's the reason that when that wall came down, we were able to ship 500,000 copies a month into the Soviet Union, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and places like that. 
I can't do it, Victor can't do it, but the Holy Spirit can do it. You see, he has the power, and he opens that up, and the word goes forth. And I've seen it time and time again. Victor in the Ural Mountains set up a blitz. That's the thing where you go in and you just uh, place Bibles everywhere you can. Uh, 11 million people in the Ural Mountains, east of Moscow. Uh, three evangelical churches like this one that would believe the Bible. They do a Bible distribution there in that land. A couple of years go by, two years go by. 120 churches there in the Ural Mountains. Pastors traveling to conference. They're having Sunday school stuff, Bible school stuff. And it's good over there in the 90s. But then guess who comes along? A fellow named Mr. Putin. <laughs> and he starts tightening it up. I just spoke to two more Soviets in Somerset that were here from Russia. How's it going over there? He said, it's pretty tough right now. Uh, things have been tightening up ever since the 90s. If you want to do anything in the Soviet Union now, you need permission from the Greek, the Russian Orthodox priest, to get that right, Russian Orthodox priest. Once you get his permission, you can grant a new some distribution. Now some of those guys help you and some of those guys hurt you. Just how it is. Some will help and some won't. But so pray for Russia and that land that that word will be distributed. But God is getting this word in there. How good that is. How good that is. Now we've all been hearing a lot about gun violence. And I love to tell this story because so many of the stories go bad and you hear all the bad things. But this is a good story where God took and turned something that was very, very bad and turned it into something good. A young man, California, Oregon border, he's angry at the police. I don't know why. He's going to get up in the morning. He has a gun. He's going to kill as many police as he can kill, take his own life. How many times have we heard that? Where somebody goes in somewhere and just shoots people they don't even know. There's a madness to it all, but Jesus told us it would be times like these. But this young man in that hotel room that night came across this book in that hotel room. And he picked it up and he gave it a pitch and it hit the wall. And he laid back down in bed and tried to sleep. Now if you're going to get up in the morning and take and kill police and take your own life, you're not going to sleep very well. So he lays back down to sleep. Five minutes later, he's sitting on the bed with his feet on the floor, looking at that gun. He looks over at that Bible he pitched and walks over and picks it up. And he starts reading that Bible. He opened that Bible up. He didn't know where he was going. The Lord knew where he was going. He opened that Bible up to the Gospel of John and started reading. He wrote us a letter. He said, as I read from the Word of God that night, my anger and my pain left my body. He said, I found in this book that God loved me. Now this is why it's important what you're doing here and your children's sermonette and the things you do for outreach. He said, in my home, no one ever told me God loved me. Can you imagine that? But that's what you're here for. To let this community know that God loves them. And he put that foolish plan that he had away. He found what Jesus did for him on the cross in there in the Gospel of John. He got down on his knees and accepted Jesus as a Savior. That young man is serving the Lord today. And he put those foolish plans away. So you pray. We just went all through Somerset replacing the Bibles in the hotels and the motels. Many, many testimonies come out of there. Now, I say this every time I speak, I'm looking for a miracle, and you're looking for it too. It's my privilege to tell you about this. It's my privilege to pray, and your privilege to pray. But we get in the schools to give a little book like this to all the fifth graders. That's a miracle in Somerset County. Can you keep a secret? We can't ever do that. We call them up, and uh, we're repetitive. We go every year, so it gets easy. But sometimes administration changes, and you get a guy on the phone that says, oh, I don't know if we should have Bible distribution here. And uh, we tell them who we are, and we've been doing that for many years. But uh, uh, we don't push. We pray. Uh, uh, pray that God will change their attitude or change their address. He's done both. <laughs> but uh, we place the Word of God. Now, I have two great-grandchildren. 
Uh, they're probably getting in trouble here, Cal. <laughs> You're not allowed to tell my family. <laughs> I have two great grandchildren. We're probably out of the ball field this morning, okay? <laughs> All right. And I went to a church in Briarwood, and I'm crossing the parking lot going to speak. And I hear cheers Sunday morning, 1030, coming from the ball field. <laughs> After church, I went home that way, and there they were on the ball field. But uh, I want you to pray that when the children receive this, they can be saved. And I can share testimony to that effect. We could be here till a long time talking about just testimonies coming out of the schools. But this comes home. The child can be saved. I want that mom and dad to be led of the Holy Ghost to say to their kid, what's that? And open it up and read just one verse. Because I know that a sinner reading one verse of God, convicted of his sin by a holy God and Holy Spirit showing him his sin, can come to his senses, receive Jesus as his Savior to be free from his sin, that family can come to your church door. That's what we're looking for. That's the miracle I want to see in the county. I believe that. I can't do it. You can't do it. But the Holy Spirit can do it. And it's our privilege to pray. It's our privilege to seek that. And the Holy Spirit has the power to do that. So I want to see a family show up at your church door because they came in contact with the Word of God. Cal and I go back a long way and we remember say I'm going to follow my parents. He followed his parents to church and I said to my wife we're going to church on Sunday and that was a long time ago. Okay. But the same Holy Spirit, the same sinners, the same lost souls. We want to see that happen. Now, uh, about one of those high school testimonies, uh, or school testimonies, I worked at the Shanksville School for about 18 months there in the elementary. I cleaned down there, and I uh, enjoyed that job. It was after I closed my business, but uh, the elementary kids will still listen to you. You've got to watch the middle school. It gets a little rough there. <laughs> That's what they stop listening <laughs> but the elementary kids will listen to you. But a teacher came up to me and she said, Bill, she said the Gideons came and our children received the testament uh, this morning. Now, if you leave it up to the kids, you got it made. You know, if they let you go back to the room and you say, who would like a copy of God's Word? All the hands go up and you give them a copy of God's Word. It doesn't get complicated until you have to go through the administrative office. Then you have to leave them at the office and get permission slips and all this stuff. It gets complicated. But the teacher said to me, Bill, a little girl received a copy of God's Word this morning. And i got to tell you something about these country teachers in our country schools. They should pay me for this because I've been going to promote them. But uh, they know their kids. Uh, remember when you went to school and you knew who the rich kids were? And you knew who the poor kids were. Uh, the teachers know. They know who the kids are in trouble. They know the kids that are okay. They know the kids that they are going to church on Sunday and the ones that don't, you know. So anyhow, this little girl, mama's on drugs, papa's in the slammer, and aunt comes by and keeps the home straightened out about half, and the teacher knows this. And the little girl's coming out of there with a Bible, a little testament, and the teacher says to her, Oh, I see you've got a copy of God's Word today. And the little girl says, yes, I'm going to throw it in the garbage. <laughs> and the teacher says, oh, no, no, no. She says, now here's the part I like. The teacher says, I have a Bible up on my desk. I read my Bible every day. You need to read that Bible. <laughs> she said, Bill, next day at break, it's 2 o'clock. The little girl's reading that Bible. Next day at break, the little girl's reading that Bible. Next day, she's reading that Bible. That little girl from that type of home found something in here that that fellow in the hotel room found. Found a God that loved him, Savior that died for him, and a way of peace and comfort that is in the covers in between these pages here. She found something, and she's going to hold on to it. I believe we'll see that little girl in heaven. So that's what we do. You know, I come here, I ask you to pray. Uh, we Gideons have been doing this a long time. Lester Lake came before me and did this, and I'm doing it after him, and I hope somebody else can do it after me. We'd all love for the Jesus to come and get us out of here. Okay, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but
But I remember, I remember uh, coming to know the Lord late in the 70s, and we went down to Frostburg and heard an evangelist, and the 80s were the decade of destiny, okay? And then I remember the 90s when it was open in the Soviet Union, and uh, many Jews were returning to the land, and Isaiah was being fulfilled, and 2000 is coming, and this is it. <laughs> but we're still here in 2024, all right? But uh, we're to work, we're to watch, and we're to pray, we're to assemble together. And what a privilege to be a Christian, have this book in these troubled times, and the comfort this book can bring. So uh, I thank you for letting me come and share. I like looking at the minor and major prophets and picking out all the stuff that speaks about the future. And uh, so much is in there. And it's so good to put yourself in here and out of this world. Amen?